distinguished guests, colleagues, former ministers, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Anna Greta, thank you so much for this very nice introduction. It always feels safe to come after you at a podium or in an office or, or elsewhere. It's very good to be back here at uh, the annual Leonkoln uh, seminar, and I want to thank the Norwegian Atlantic Committee with Kate and also her very good associates, I have to say, for pulling it off in style once again. And this has really become a very important venue for addressing key security interests and issues, and I'm just overwhelmed to see the, the turnout here today. It is not new, it's always like this, uh, and it's very good. I have promised James, though, that I will not touch upon any of his topics like NATO or security policy. So this will be a very uh, kind, of a, kind of a strange introduction for a defense minister, but we'll see uh, how it works. Uh, this year's topic, uh, security in Northern Europe after Crimea, Brexit, and the US election. Let us just dwell for a moment um, on this extraordinary combination of words in one sentence. Security in Northern Europe after Crimea, Brexit, and the US election. Imagine you just woke up from a three-year hibernation, and you were told that Russia had taken a part of Ukraine, that the UK has decided to leave the EU, and that Donald Trump is now the president of the United States. <laughs> you would probably have had some difficulties believing all of it. Uh, and in these days of, of a lot of winter sports, it's like being told that Sweden has beaten Norway in the cross-country World Cup. <laughs> it wouldn't seem very likely. It's probably too grave to joke about. <laughs> but as you know, we all take skiing very seriously up here. But making fun of each other uh, has been kind of a social glue of the Nordic cooperation for centuries, and I don't see any reason why we should stop now. But, dear friends, we are meeting in very challenging times. Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea and the following and continuing destabilization of eastern Ukraine changed the European security landscape almost overnight. Our increasingly assertive neighbor has demonstrated their will and also their ability to use military force and other more covert means in order to achieve their objectives. And the covert means, of course, are especially designed to cast as much doubt as possible into decision-making processes. And by doing so, they have been violating international law. They shook the very foundation of the framework for peace and stability that we all built together on the ruins of two devastating world wars. The Nordic and the Baltic countries had to think about security in a new way. The Eastern European countries also had to think about security in a new way. NATO, as well as the EU, had to think about security in a new way. We all had to adapt quickly and united to a new, uncertain, and unpredictable security environment. The EU and the US imposed restrictive measures, which Norway and other non-EU countries uh, adopted in solidarity. And as an alliance, NATO demonstrated its ability to rapidly adjust, as well as to provide reassurance for Eastern allies. And I will not take up your time by telling you a story that you do know, but I want to point out that this was a dramatic change by way of external developments, something that happened outside our countries, but with great implications for our countries. And by our countries, I mean the Transatlantic Alliance and the Nordics. Brexit and the US election, however, happened at home, inside our own host, house, so to speak. The British people voted, the American people voted, and the result took many of us by surprise. Brexit and the US elections were two very different things, and I think we should be careful to compare them as such. But one thing they had in common is that they revealed a significant level of frustration and discontent a lot of people. And this is something that we're seeing not only in the US and the UK, but also in many other European countries. If I am to suggest any common denominator between Crimea, Brexit, and the US elections concerning security in Northern Europe, it must be this. They were all major wake-up calls, 
albeit for different reasons. They have all introduced uncertainty at some level. And they have all set in motion change and developments that we do not know the extent of. We find ourselves in a time of political, economic, and social disruption. The world as we have known it for decades is changing, and it's changing rapidly. In 1992, the American political scientist and author, Francis Fukuyama, published the book, The End of History and the Last Man. It was an unusually defensive book in that it suggested that the Western liberal democracy represented the end point of mankind's ideological evolution, and thus the final form of human government. While he recognized that liberal democracies may suffer temporary setbacks, he argued that this is basically as good as it gets. This is the very best that we can do and there can be no progression from liberal democracy to an alternative, better system. The book was written in an optimistic time of change. The Berlin Wall had fallen, the Soviet Union had collapsed, the Cold War was over, and a warm wind of optimism swept across Europe. I think it's safe to say that the weather has changed. Fukuyama may be right. Perhaps the liberal democracy, with all its dilemmas, all its compromises, is the best form of government we are capable of designing. After all, it has enabled economic growth, prosperity, peace and stability between nations for decades. But it seems we may have arrived at a time in history where the liberal democracy, as we know it, is facing one of its most serious challenges to date. The very framework of a stable Europe and transatlantic relationship is under pressure. Right-wing populism is on the rise in many countries, paving the way for different forms of nationalism. Liberal democratic ideas of freedom, equality, and inclusion are losing terrain to ideas of the opposite. We're witnessing more distrust between people and a deteriorating belief in democratic institutions, in politicians, and in media. Public discourse and political debates in many countries are increasingly characterized by fear, xenophobia, disinformation, and conflict. Social media echo reinforce whatever reality people subscribe to, no matter where you are on the political, cultural, and social spectrum. Facts, scientific knowledge, and objective truth the very building blocks of human development are becoming devalued currencies in a post-factual world. It is a sort of convergence of discontent that we're witnessing. I have for some time expressed my concerns with the health condition of European politics. The reasons for this are many and complex, and I will in no way pretend that I have all the answers, and I don't think anybody does. But I do think that many of us, both in Europe and the US, failed for a long time to realize the extent and significance of the growing discontent amongst large groups of people. And by doing so, we have contributed to creating a fertile ground for populism and the polarized political climate that we're seeing today. We also know that this development is actively fueled by Russia through intelligence and information operations, hacking, trolling, and a range of other means in order to influence elections and undermine European and transatlantic cohesion. Ironically, the strengths of our liberal democracies, trust, transparency, free speech, independent media, the rule of law, is also what makes, it, makes us vulnerable to Russia's actions in the non-kinetic domain. It's, of course, too early to say what the implications will be of Brexit and the transnational anti-establishment movements. France, Germany, the Netherlands, and also Norway are having elections this year. And I would lie if I would say that I wasn't concerned, given the current political climate and the examples that we have seen of Russian subversive influence. And I am pleased with the recent dialogue with and statements from the new US administration emphasizing US commitment to NATO, 
and transatlantic security. But at the same time, there are still a lot of things that we do not know about President Trump's foreign and security policy. While I don't think we should exaggerate the significance of Russian influence, I don't think we should underestimate it either. In any case, we need to pay close attention to what is going on in our own countries now. Because the features and the underlying currents that I just described, in many countries, it may also undermine international defense and security cooperation at a time where the need for cooperation is maybe greater than ever. The security challenges that we are facing, from violent extremism, a more assertive and destabilizing Russia, and the consequences of conflict in North Africa and Middle East, requires more trust and closer cooperation, not the opposite. And given the current situation, one of my biggest concerns is that our ability to make decisions in NATO, in the EU, will be challenged. Over the next two days, you will cover a range of perspectives with regards to security in Northern Europe. And as we all know, the challenges to Northern European security are many and complex. I think the greatest challenge right now is not one single threat, but the combined uncertainty and unpredictability of the multitude of developments that are happening at the same time, both within and outside our countries. Very few, if any, of our challenges can be solved with military means alone. But the last three years have shown us that military power remains an indispensable part of our security policy toolbox. The fight against ISIL and violent extremism requires military response as part of a broad, comprehensive approach. And Russia's actions have caused the need to bolster European defense capabilities and cooperation, both through NATO, between the Nordic countries, and bilaterally between friends and allies. Norway's top priority in NATO for the past two years has been a renewed maritime focus and an increased attention to the North Atlantic and the High North. They are clear responses from NATO to the uncertainty introduced by Russia in the region. We do not consider Russia a military threat towards Norway today. And I want to be clear on that, as I always am when I talk about these issues. However, Norway is NATO in the north, and we share a border with an increasingly assertive neighbor, neighbor with superpower aspirations. A neighbor who has modernized its armed forces, significantly increased its military presence in the high north, reintroduced old east versus west, west schismatic thinking, engaged in subversive actions against Western democracies, violated international law, and undermined European stability. While we expect Russia to remain true to our long-standing and common interest in keeping the high north stable and peaceful, we must also acknowledge that tension and conflict in other places may develop into a more serious situation in the north. And that, of course, has implications, as it has always had, for Norwegian defense planning. Parliament approved the, Norwegian, the government's new long-term plan in November of last year. It represents an historic priority of our armed forces. Over the next 20 years, we will invest and increase our defense budget by 180 billion Norwegian kroner, which equals around 22 billion US dollars. And this comes at a time where our abilities and defense capabilities were starting to get uh, built down. We're now making sure that our armed forces has the combat power, the readiness, the flexibility, and sustainability that we need in a changing and unpredictable security environment. We're strengthening our military presence and our intelligence capabilities. Our new fleet of F-35s uh, is on its way. We will receive the first two planes later this year. And in addition, we're investing heavily in new maritime patrol aircraft, new submarines, air defense, land power capabilities, and also intelligence. 
NATO and American security guarantees remain the cornerstone of our security policy. And as a NATO member, Norway also has an obligation to contribute to the collective security framework that we're a part of and we depend upon. We take our obligations seriously. In addition, defense cooperation between the Nordic countries and between the Nordic and the Baltic countries has picked up over the last years, not least as a result of Russia's assertiveness and unpredictability. The Baltic Sea region has become a center of gravity in the region. Increased Russian activity, more aggressive posture has made the Nordic countries concerned. A crisis or conflict in the Baltic Sea region may also spread to the high north. The Nordic countries have a responsibility to promote stability and security in our region. While Norway and Denmark are members of NATO, Sweden and Finland are not. But as close friends and neighbors, we're facing the same challenges. That has sparked us to strengthen our dialogue and step up our military cooperation. We have established secure communication lines between our countries and we continue to, to develop our cooperation with regards to air surveillance, international operations, joint training and exercises. Last year, we signed an agreement with the aim of allowing easier access to each other's air, sea and land domain for common training purposes in peacetime. Almost every week, Finnish, Swedish and Norwegian fighter jets are training together in the north, cross-border training. And with NATO's partnership with Sweden and Finland, and both countries' participation in annual winter exercises in Norway and their planned participation in next year's NATO exercise Trident Juncture in Norway, we are taking Nordic and NATO cooperation to a new level. Firmly rooted in our NATO membership, Norway sees Nordic cooperation as a pragmatic and sensible approach to increasing predictability, ensuring stability, and promoting peaceful cooperation without confrontation or conflict in our part of the world. We have this shared understanding of the security challenges that we're facing. And we are all adapting our defense capabilities. The value of those close consultations has increased in a changing security environment. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's topic is security in Northern Europe. It's difficult to navigate in this new and complex security environment. And you will have plenty of time to dive deeper into this during the next two days. I do not have all the solutions. But if there is one thing that I am sure of, it's that the challenges that we are facing are so big, interlinked, and complicated that we must face them together. And right now, I am concerned that the European and American political climate change may get in the way of that. Let's not make that our biggest challenge on top of all the other challenges. I hope you have a very good seminar over the next two days. And whatever you do in a Nordic setting, do not dis start discussions on cross-country skiing. Thank you. <laughs>